Hey there, Clarifiles and Clarifilettes. It's, uh, you know, kind of unique because normally I do these videos without any notes. I don't torture any, uh, what do you, you call those things? Uh, uh, teleprompters. Uh, no, I, I actually own one, but I find it's too inconvenient to actually use. So, uh, anyway, but I have uncharacteristically taken a few notes here because I do have some plans that contrary maybe to popular opinion. Um, we're going to treat this kind of like a classroom because we're going to be continuing our discussion about learning how to play double lip. And uh, the next video, we're actually going to talk about um, how to develop double lip, how to play, what to, what to play, and all kinds of specific things you're going to need to actually get started, okay? But uh, at this point, uh, I feel it's as long as I've got your attention, I hope I've got your attention. Uh, uh, as long as I've got your opinion, your attention, I want to share some things with you that you can carry with you uh, in this whole process and throughout your music making. Uh, so what we're going to have is a short discussion. I'll try to keep it short. And then uh, I'm going to have some questions for you. I need you to answer these questions for me. We can use that in the next video as a taking off point. So it's very helpful if you tell me uh, what the answer to these questions that I'm asking. And don't be afraid. It's not going to be a test, and you're not going to have to study for it. Or better said, maybe you've been studying for it all your clarinet playing life. Um, and then I've got something I want you, again, to respond to. It's a photograph, and I want you to tell me your observations. So with that, let's begin our discussion. You know, there are a few times in your life, if you're lucky, that you hear something, something concise, something very pithy, that is in a sense a principle or a taking off point that you can base your whole thinking on in terms of a specific issue. And uh, I had one of those experiences many years ago reading an article. And it was an article by a clarinet player, which was a self-interview in a clarinet magazine. I can't remember because it's a long, long time ago. But he asked himself about the idea of clarinet tone. And... Um, he said something I'm not going to repeat here because I don't agree with it. But then he said this striking thing. He said, the function of tone is phrasing. In other words, in a way you could sort of say, beauty is as beauty does. A beautiful tone that is nothing but a beautiful tone is not really musical because it doesn't do anything but be a thing in itself. But a beautiful tone is a tone that is variable and is sinuous and expressive, that, that changes shape, it changes color, according to the expressive demands of the music. And that's the thing that I would like you to think about. Many people are taught, in a sense, and they labor very hard, actually, to gain what they call a beautiful tone. They're taught... Uh, um, they're taught clarinet tone as a, as a, uh, what I guess uh, maybe a Hegel it is, we would call it a Ding an sich. That's a German phrase that means a thing in itself. That you just get this beautiful tone. Oh, I want that beautiful tone. He's got a beautiful tone. I want a tone like that. And so you strive to get that tone. But this statement, um, which was, I'm going to have to write it, the function of tone is phrasing, this statement leads us to believe that tone is not an end in itself, but a means. It's a means to playing phrasing expressively with true depth and emotion. You notice, for instance, a great oboist or a great violinist, and listen to how they shape phrases. Listen to all the variability and dynamics and color and just even the shape of the tone. It gets broader or more narrow. It gets ribbon-shaped. It, 
It has all kinds of things. And this is the, the thing I hear that's lacking in so many clarinet players and so many famous clarinet players that have all technique to burn and stuff. It's amazing and it's admirable, okay? In itself, it's admirable. But this really is not the ultimate. Making technique, tonguey fast, playing with agility, none of that really means anything if you can't make the clarinet play with the expressive power um, and with the, you know, the great dynamic, not in sound, but I mean the great dy dynamic expressive variability that you hear in a great singer like Dietrich fischer dieskau or Elizabeth Schwarzkopf. Or um, you hear in, uh, you know, a great oboist or a great bassoonist like Marisa Lard. If you haven't heard these guys, you really need to hear them. Um, and, and, many, and many other players. Uh, and then we come to Harold Wright. And I say, Harold Wright is really great, okay? He's really great because he didn't just listen to clarinet players. He's really great because his major influences were not clarinet players. Yes, he learned his mechanics and technique from Ralph McLean and the double lip school, the French school that goes back to Philippe Mimar and I think it's Mimar and uh, and um, I can't remember the clarinetist that he studied with who played for a couple years in Boston and then returned to France. Uh, so yes, he got those mechanics and he got those techniques but his style of playing, the nuance and the variability, you really didn't hear in the earlier players. They were great, they had wonderful sounds, they had a wonderful technique and very fluid, beautiful legato and very even sounds all the way up, but you just did not hear the beautiful expressive variability and nuance in their playing as you do in Harold Wright's playing. And again, it's because he didn't listen only the clarinet players. He listened, I think, and probably admired a lot of other players a lot more than clarinet players. So I'm not banging on clarinet players, all right? I'm not bashing them at all, all right? Uh, but I am saying that there's more out there than just producing this beautiful golden tone and so on and so forth. And I think double lip really lends itself to opening up a whole world of expression and variability and nuance in your phrasing and your control and so on and so forth. And we're going to go all into that. But I'd like that phrase, the function of tone is phrasing. Uh, I'd like that to be something that settles in your mind and to think about, think about. When, uh, you know, I first heard it, it hit me like a bolt from the blue. So, as I'm, you know, fond of saying, that's my story, I'm sticking to it. I'm sharing that with you, and I'd like that to be something that you, from time to time, meditate on, you know, while you're, I don't know, playing video games and in between times, or, or watching the latest cat video on YouTube, and those are pretty cute, yeah. So now it's question time, okay? And uh, this will be on the test. No. Uh, I'm going to ask you to give your own subjective answer, your own personal answer to this question. In looking into double lip um, and following these videos and trying to apply them, what are your goals? What would you like to achieve? What don't you like in your playing right now that you hope Double Lip will supply and make better? Okay? So just don't give me a knee-jerk answer. I want you to think about this and then write it to me down below. Well, down to below, that's the floor down there. But you know what I mean, you know that, all that stuff that people write about below the YouTube videos? Yeah, down there, okay, put it down there. Um, and so I can read it. I will read it this next week. And next week I'll have a presentation on how to actually begin playing double lip. And so uh, accompanying that question, what are your goals? What would you want to achieve? What do you 
not completely happy with and you hope Double Lip will supply, I have an assignment for you. And it's an analytical assignment class. So listen up. This will be on the test. I'm going to provide uh, in, uh, in a minute or so a photograph. A photograph that I've actually cropped. Uh, and I'm glad that the person took the photographs. It's a photograph of Harold Wright playing uh, when he was playing at Marlboro when he was a very young man. It's, it's in the 1950s. And what I've done is I've cropped the video, or cropped the photograph, so that you can see this whole area while he's playing. And I want you to study his embouchure, the relationship of the upper and lower teeth, the lips, the mouthpiece. And so I want you to study that and write to me down below, down below, you know, write to me what you see. Okay? And with that, we're done. You can return to watching those cat videos and hey, look, look at some of the dog videos too. They're really great. All right? And I'll um, see you next week. And I hope some of you will take me up on these things that I'm asking of you, okay? Because it's taken me a lot of time to give, to think about and prepare these videos that uh, were coming up here. And I'm spending some time, and I hope you'll spend some quality time and just do a few of the things that I ask. And I'll try to supply the rest to you. And in the meantime, keep yourself safe. Have a good week. Stay inside. This is the time to get some practice done.